grateful you're here. Good morning, Stanton. We are grateful for you also, and for those who may be watching our, our iCampus. Uh, this morning will be a little different. I mean, it'll be the same format. That may be the same. Don't stress about that. But instead of me uh, preaching today, you'll get a good message today, which will be awesome. Uh, they didn't catch the joke, I guess. So. Anyway, uh, so my friend Tim Sadler will be speaking here shortly, and uh, Tim, um, Tim, long-term pastor, um, served on Illinois Baptist State Association um, staff as uh, director of evangelism, and um, and now he uh, has his own Edward D. Jones office. So, um, so he's multi. He's a multifaceted young man, and he used to have facial hair. So it's kind of hard for me to get used to not having facial hair. That's kind of deal. And for those who are uh, friends of Brady, he used to be Brady's roommate in college. So those of us who need any kind of dirt on Brady, talk to Tim afterwards. Uh, by the way, Brady might be watching this morning. He said he, you know, so he might be, just so you have something, he'll be mocking you later, so hold on about that. In your bulletins this morning, by the way, I don't usually do this, but I want to today, since I'm not the one speaking. Um, front page just tells you what our goals are for in Measuring More December. And none of these goals are really about the goals. It's really about our church stepping into who we're supposed to be, who God called us to be. That it's not about, you know, beating last month's attendance statistics. It's not about being bigger or better or faster than we were, you know, last year. It's we are called to make an impact. Um, Fifteen salvation goals. Um, a goal of 15 salvations for our church. We ought to be baptizing. We ought to be seeing people get saved every day. You know, every week there'll be salvations. Every how you want to word it, there'll be salvations taking place. We are in a dry and thirsty land. There are people who need Jesus. That's the way it works, right? And if that's not happening, a lot of times it's just because we don't focus on it. So we're going to focus on it for this month. And um, the 30 baptisms, um, that may seem like a lot. There are more than 30 of you. If no one else receives Christ, there are more than 30 of you who have yet to be baptized by immersion. Now, we don't believe baptism saves you, right? So we don't make a big deal about it. It's not like, well, you, oh, don't want to go to hell, better get baptized. It, once you know Christ your Savior, you know Christ your Savior. But you, we want you to take a public stand, a public identification with Christ. That's the whole point of baptism. It's not about getting wet in front of people. Well, I feel nervous about that. Listen, the whole point about baptism is to make a public stand of your faith in Christ. It's the identification of the death, you know, you're dying with Christ and being raised again in life. And, and so if you know Christ, you're saved. If you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and yet to be baptized, today will be a good day to write down your form, uh, your next step card, and turn in the offering plate at the end of the service, and we'll, we'll get your baptism scheduled. Um, that's something we all be doing regularly. A baptism, I'll be, a, you know, we, we, we pray, we sing, we take up offerings, we preach. We we'll make announcements and we baptize. That'll be every service's schedule. You know what I mean? It's just a normal thing we do. So uh, be prayerful about that. So my friend Tim, come on up, Tim. Um, I told him, that, you can clap if you want to, all right? I told, um, I told Tim that you were an easy group to preach to. All right, so be nice. Thanks, buddy. Good morning. So good to be with you. Uh, I, uh, I've known your pastor for... Um, well, I was like five when I met him, and he just graduated from college or something like that. And so I love your pastor. I love your story. I mean, God's grace and God's mercy, God's power, and his providence in the story of your church is amazing. And I've been watching you from afar. You don't know that. Not in a creepy sense, but... Uh, <laughs> but I've been watching what God has done uh, when you added another campus and I mean, it's just an amazing story and uh, I'm, I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for the impact that you're having, uh, not just here in Carlinville, but in McCoupin County as it kind of extends out. So pastor, thank you so much for letting me be here today. I'm honored. I'm excited. I hope you're excited. I mean, it is a little early to be excited, but I'm excited. And I want to encourage you to take your, your copy of God's word this morning. Go to John chapter three. Uh, I did serve as the director of evangelism for the Illinois Baptist State Association. Loved my uh, job there. Uh, nearly a thousand churches trying to impact the lostness here in Illinois. And so we're going to go to one of my favorite passages today, John chapter three, find that. In just a moment, we'll come back to that. I want you to find John chapter 12 first. So put your finger over in John chapter 3. 
and go find John chapter 12. I've entitled the message this morning, Hope in a World of Hopelessness. Hope in a World of Hopelessness. And for the last five and a half years or so, I traveled extensively in Illinois and throughout the United States and even uh, some outside of the United States. I wrote something called Choose Two, which is an evangelistic prayer strategy. And so God just opened up a lot of doors for me to travel. If there's one consistent thing through all of those days on the road and different churches and too many hotels and eating in an Applebee's by myself, uh, there's one thing I've found, and that is... People are searching for answers. They're looking for hope. And they're longing many times for a way out of the situation they find themselves in. If you just think recently, the attacks in Paris, San Bernardino, Colorado, it just... It just seems that hopelessness is pervasive, and we, we wonder, is, is there hope anymore? Even believers that I would talk to, I mean, there's just a sense of, I don't know if there's hope anymore. So it seems that everywhere you look, every place you go, there's hopelessness, hopeless situations exist, whether it's cultural decline, wars, or rumors of wars, global persecution, fractured families, health diagnosis that is, that is terminal. My mom, by the way, fourth time in three and a half years, she's been diagnosed with cancer. She's now on her second trial drug. She takes the drug and she's in bed for about seven to nine days. She can't get out of bed. She's miserable. I told my dad a week ago, I, I'm afraid mom's going to wake up one day and say, I'm just done. I'm just, I'm just done with this. She's much smaller than she was when four years ago she was first diagnosed with colon cancer and it became colorectal melanoma and then it became melanoma of the lymph nodes and then the melanoma, we just found it again about two months ago because she fell and when she fell, her arm broke and found that she had a mass, the melanoma moved to her bones. It seems that everywhere you look, it just feels like there's hopelessness. But I'm convinced and I'm convicted that there is still hope. And so this morning in our brief time together, what I want to do is I want to look for the solution to our hopeless world. And I think there is a solution. As a matter of fact, I think there's not only a solution for the hopelessness, I think the source of hope speaks to us directly in his word. So look at John chapter 12. In John chapter 12, verse 32, listen to what Jesus says. John chapter 12, verse 32, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. Now we've heard this text misapplied so many times. We, we've heard people say, you know what, if we just lift up Jesus, if, we, if we'll just praise Jesus and lift him up in our lives and make, just, you know, make, make much of Jesus, then that's how he draws all people to himself. Now listen, that's not a bad thing. It's just not what the text says. Because the next verse actually explains what Jesus is referring to. Verse 33. This he said signifying by what death he would die. So Jesus said, if I am lifted up, speaking about the cross, it's through the cross that I will draw all men, women, boys and girls into myself. Now go to John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, we're going to begin reading in verse 14. We'll actually cover verses 1 down through verse 16. I hope you don't have plans till noon, but it's going to take a while. John chapter 3, verse 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. May God bless the reading of his word. You know, I struggled for many years. I didn't really understand why in the world when I read John chapter 3, verse 16, which is 
Everyone's favorite verse, especially the guy who sits in the end zone at every NFL. I mean, I would love to have. How does he have the money to go to all those NFL games? That's, I'd love to know. It's probably my favorite verse in all of Scripture. I'll share my other favorite at the very end today. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. But for some reason, verse 14, it was always a struggle for me. Why in the world does Jesus all of a sudden reference about a serpent being lifted up and connects it to him being lifted up on the cross? And so today I've got three things I want to share with you just quickly from John chapter 3. I want you to see, number one, that Jesus is going to clearly define every person's need. There's one need that each of us in this room possesses. It's also a need that everyone who's ever been born on planet Earth has. This is a need that is consistent throughout the human race. Go to verse 1 in John chapter 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. Uh, I was listening, uh, ironically one time, I was listening to preaching instead of doing it myself. And this guy was talking about Nicodemus. No clue. Nicodemus. He was talking about Nicodemus. One preacher on the radio was talking about Onesimus. You ever read about Onesimus? Over in Philemon, Onesimus, or anyhow, sorry. So there was a man of the Pharisees named, or Nicodemus, whatever, okay. A ruler of the Jews, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, or truly, truly, verily, verily, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time to his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now notice verse three, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse five, he cannot enter the kingdom of God unless he or she has been born a second time. Again, born again. That which is born of the flesh, Jesus says, it's flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel at I said to you, you must be born again. Jesus said it again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. At least four times in this text, Jesus talks about being born again. If you haven't been born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. If you haven't been born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. You must be born again. This is not just Nicodemus' need. This is every person that's ever been born. You say, Tim, how do you know that? Well, I know that because of what the text says. Look at verse 3. Immediately Jesus, after Nicodemus approaches him, Nicodemus doesn't ask him a question. As a matter of fact, it's an indicative. Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God. No one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Verse 3, immediately Jesus makes a statement back to him and says, Truly I say to you, unless you've been born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus asked the question that all of us want to ask. How is that even possible? How can a grown man enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born? That's not even possible, Jesus. Of course, you and I both know that that's not Jesus, what Jesus is talking about at all. You, you need to be born again. And so verse 5 and verse 6 become critical in understanding every person's need. Let me see if I can explain it. Verse 5 says that we need to be born of the water and of the Spirit. That's what verse 5 says. Truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, at this place, some people get confused. Your pastor did a wonderful job this morning already saying that baptism does not save us. The water does not save us. But there are those who would take this verse and say, look, it says you need to be born of the water and the Spirit and say, okay, you've got to be baptized and be birthed by the Spirit of God, and then you can see and enter the kingdom of God. But that's not what Jesus is saying. Because in verse 6, Jesus clarifies what he means in verse 5. Verse 5 says, you need to be born of the flesh, or rather born of the water and the spirit. 
And verse 6 says, whatever is flesh is flesh, and whatever is spirit is spirit. Now he's doing something uh, that, that is a very common uh, rabbinic technique where he's paralleling two different ideas. So here's idea number one. You need to be born of water, verse 5. Verse 6, you need to be born of the, the flesh, right? Water and flesh. That's what he's paralleling in verse 5 and verse 6. You need to be born of water, which is the birth of the flesh. You say, how do you know that? I know that because I'm the father of four children. 13, 11, four-year seminary gap, two broke to have children, then two more children. Okay? What is the one phrase that's terrifying to every man on the face of the planet? Ladies, my water just broke because to a man that means at least 22 years of incredible expense four children they love apple devices my five-year-old wants an ipad for christmas i was lucky if i got a loaf of bread for christmas in the 70s she she's five she's five she came to me last night she said dad you need an update you need an update. How do you know what an update is? Dad, somebody just tweeted you. How do you know what a tweet is? You're five. She, she can't read the tweet. She knows what Twitter is. I said, Ella Grace, what are you doing? I'm looking at Allie's Instagram. How do you know what Instagram is? 22 years, at least. Parents, can I get a witness? At least 22 years. Sometimes they do the unthinkable and they move back home. As soon as my kids get out, I'm downsizing to a two-bedroom apartment. They, there's no room. There's no room. You sleep in the garage. Get a job. That which is born of water is also born of the flesh. Here's the parallel. Born of the Spirit, in verse 6, born of the Spirit is Spirit. What Jesus is saying clearly to Nicodemus is this. Nicodemus, you have a need. You have already accomplished the first kind of birth. Nicodemus, were you born? Yeah, I was born. Okay. Have you been born again? What do you mean, Jesus? Have you been born again by the Spirit of God? And in this room today and all over planet Earth, most of us have accomplished step number one, which is to be born in flesh. How many of you have been born in the flesh? Anybody? Should hover around about 100%. Okay. Jesus said that Nicodemus had a need, and his need was to be born of the Spirit of God. Now, what Jesus means is you need to be born again. You need to be regenerated, birthed anew by the Spirit of God. You need a new sort of birth, Nicodemus. You covered the fleshly birth. You are a man in the flesh. But Nicodemus, you have a great need in your life. You need to be birthed by the Spirit of God. And I would say to you this morning, maybe you've been born. But maybe you have not been born again. And Jesus said, you need to be born again. This is Nicodemus' greatest need. And if you're here today and you've not been born again, you do not have a greater need than to be born again by the Spirit of God. It is the greatest need that every human has. But not only does Jesus clearly define every person's need, Jesus concisely describes every person's situation in the next few verses. I want you to go again to verse 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus concisely describes every person's situation. Now, I do, I, I told you all ago, I, I struggle with why in the world this verse is there for a long time. And I think God has, has spoken, and, and I think I, I have a better understanding. Do you remember what kind of man Nicodemus is? The Bible tells us in verse 1. What is he? He's what? 
He's a Pharisee, okay? So as a little boy, his parents would have attached him to a learned teacher of the law. Paul was attached to a learned teacher of the law. His name was Gamaliel. That's who Paul was attached to as a little boy. And parents can take their little boys, and if they choose to, they can attach them to a learned teacher of the law so that they can grow up learning the law of God. And when they say the law, what they mean is the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. We call it the law, the Torah, or the Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And most people believe that by the time that a young man is 13 years old, he would have memorized the Pentateuch. Wow. You say, why would you memorize the Pentateuch? Well, because they didn't have like a Christian bookstore down the road where they can go buy a copy of the Old Testament. So they would go and they would sit under the reading of the law over and over and over and over again so that they could take God's word and hide God's word deep inside of their lives. So that by the time they're 13 years old, all of the stories from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, all of those stories would have been firmly planted inside of their life. So when Jesus references this very obscure story from the book of Numbers, immediately Nicodemus would have understood what Jesus is talking about. And so Jesus says... Look there in verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up. Jesus is building a connection here about the kind of death he was about to go, uh, he was about to go through and a story from the Old Testament. So in your Bible, if you want to go back to the law in the book of Numbers, or chapter 21, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and then Numbers, Numbers chapter 21, verse 4. Then they journeyed from Mount Or by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? So they're discouraged, and now they're complaining. There's no food, there's no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and many of the people of Israel thought, I just have to chuckle because do you know how many Baptist business meetings I've been in in my 40 years of life? I just wondered if when we're in a business meeting complaining, I wonder what would happen if God sent fiery serpents into our churches. Sorry, it's, I hate to expose what's going on in here. But anyhow, therefore, verse seven, the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. Maybe that's what would happen. We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he would take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent. So this is God's command. Make a fiery serpent, okay? Set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Immediately, Nicodemus, a Pharisee, would have remembered this exact story. Now, Nicodemus is not an unchurched guy. He's actually a churched guy in the sense that he loved the law of God. He wanted to honor the law of God. He even loved the God of Israel. But Jesus said he had a great need, and his great need was you need to be born again. And so then Jesus tells a story to remind Nicodemus about his spiritual condition You see, this is every person's spiritual situation. Before you meet Christ, we are just like the people of Israel. We have been bitten in a sense, and we are dying. Now in this story, fiery serpents had come. They were biting the people of Israel, and they were in excruciating pain, and some of them were dying. So they went to Moses and said, Moses, you got to pray for us. You've got to find a solution for us. So Moses goes to God, he prays to God, and God says, fashion a serpent, stick it on a pole, lift it up, and when everybody looks at the serpent, anybody who's been bitten, if they'll just look on the serpent, they'll be healed. 
Do you understand what the Bible teaches about our situation? That we are in a hopeless spiritual situation. David said in Psalm 51, in sin did my mother conceive me. It wasn't a statement about his mother. It was a statement of being born into the human race. We have a spiritual condition. Paul says we are dead in our sins and our trespasses. We do not have the ability to make ourselves alive again. We are dead in our sins. We have no hope. Paul goes on to say that we are enemies of God in our minds. We are bent towards sin. We're bent towards self. And we have a destination called hell. That's our situation. That's not my opinion. That's the word of God. And Jesus is trying to tell Nicodemus there's a problem in your life. You're in a situation where you have no hope. Do you understand that we are guilty on two counts? We're guilty because we were born into Adam's race. Paul says, in Adam all die. In Christ all may live. So I'm guilty because I'm born into Adam's race. I'm also guilty because I have willfully chosen to disobey the law of God. We choose the immediate gratification of sin over God's plan for our lives. And so when we sin, what we do is we put ourselves in the place of God in our lives. We kick God off the throne of our lives and we make decisions that make us happy for the moment. But have awful consequences in the future. There's no way that you and I can clean ourselves enough. There's no way that we can do enough good stuff to make God happy. It is not possible. We have this awful situation where we are sin sick, dead in our trespasses, and we need a rescuer. It's almost like this. It's almost like you have no ability to swim and there's a torrential rainfall that happens and the river swells. You get caught in the middle. There are stones tied around your legs and you cannot swim and you are, you are going to drown and you are going to die. There is no hope for you. And all of a sudden, a rescuer comes and reaches in and pulls you out. But if the rescuer doesn't come, there is no hope. And that's Nicodemus' problem. He has no hope unless a rescuer comes. And you and I have no hope unless a rescuer comes. Jesus clearly defined every person's need. Then he dis concisely describes every person's situation. If you're here this morning and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, you have a great need in your life to be born again. And your situation is that you can't fix your own problem. We are helpless, and we're hopeless. And we're powerless to change our situation. We're sinners that are shackled by shame and guilt. And we are completely unable to make ourselves alive spiritually. Look quickly at Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Many of you know it by memory, I'm sure. For God, or rather, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, in my early days, when Brady Weldon and I were in college together, and he was traveling the world, and I really couldn't find a place to preach very much, and he's flying all over and speaking to thousands. 
And if he's listening this morning, I was helping him through Greek. But anyhow, I'm not bragging. I'm just saying you can't show up to class twice a week. And anyhow, I want you to look at Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That word there, all, is an interesting word. When you study the morphology of that word all, going all the way back to the time of Jesus when this was penned shortly after Jesus' life, that word all, study the morphology of it. Go back and, and do the homework. That word all there, you might want to write this down, that word all actually means all. So that's like 100%. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's our situation. Go to Romans chapter 6, verse 23. The news gets worse. I thought this was supposed to be good news. I'm not there yet. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. That's separation from God. Eternally. The wages of sin. What you and I deserve because we have defied the law of God and chosen our own way, the wages of sin is death. If I worked all week, I get wages at the end of the week. You and I have, through our choices, we have earned something. It's not God's fault. It's not our environment's fault. We have earned the penalty of death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I love how today we're taking some of our older hymns and we're, we're kind of rewriting them. One of my favorite older hymns, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Think about that. Saved, rescued a wretch like me. Me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. That's what God has done for us in Christ. Our situation was we're helpless and hopeless and dead in our sins, and a rescuer came. You say, Tim, how did a rescuer come? I'm really glad you asked that question. It's point number three. Jesus completely destroys the power of sin through the cross. Go back to verse 14 in John chapter 3. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Remember John 12, verse 32. Jesus said, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men, women, boys, and girls to myself, all peoples to myself, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life, which is the opposite of eternal death. So we deserve death, but God offers us in Christ eternal life. If we will, the Bible says, verse 15, whoever believes in him, that's the son of man who's lifted up on the cross. If we'll believe, place our faith, trust in him, his work on the cross, not our good works. There, the Bible says as filthy rags in the presence of God. If we'll believe in him, his work on the cross, we will have not eternal death, but eternal life for here's why, because God loves Loved the world. That word love there is the Greek word agape. It is not a conditional love. It is a purposed, unconditional love. It is a choosing sort of love. God chose to love disobedient people through his son who had zero hope outside of him. If he did not become our rescuer, we had no hope. But God sent his son to die in our place. That he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes, there's that word again, believes actually seven times in this text. Seven times the word for believe or its derivative is used. Believe, trust, put your faith in. If you will believe that whoever believes in him would not perish, that's die and go to hell, but would have everlasting life. Verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes, verse 18, in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Nicodemus had a need. He needed to be born again. 
He couldn't do that for himself. He was in a bad situation. You are spiritually dead. God sent us a rescuer. His name is Jesus. And I'm convinced the only hope of the world today is Jesus himself. He's the only hope for my life individually, and he is the only hope for our world globally. My hope is not in politics or politicians. My hope is not in the economy or my job. My hope is not in my home or the possessions that I have. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. So here's the gospel according to Jesus, just quickly from these verses. The Father gave the Son, who is lifted up on the cross just like the serpent. And if you are dying today because of the disease of sin, then fix your eyes in faith on Jesus. There's no salvation without the cross. If you look to Jesus today, you will be healed spiritually and you will live eternally. So faith in Jesus' substitutionary atoning death on the cross. In other words, he went there, he shed his blood, he had never sinned, so when he died in your place, it was sufficient. The Father was pleased. The wrath of God was poured out on Jesus at the cross. The wrath of God that I deserved and you deserved, all that was poured out on Jesus at the cross. So then the cross is a must. Jesus is the only way to be rescued out of our sin. If he's not lifted up on the cross, he cannot draw men, women, boys, and girls into salvation. So the question becomes, how do I get this hope into my life? Go back to Romans just quickly. In Romans chapter 10, this is what Paul says. Tim, how do I get that hope in my life? Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved or rescued. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Look at verse 11. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Three times. Believe. Tim, I want that hope in my life. Believe. Tim, I, I, I'm stuck in my sin. I, I can't get out. It seems that I try harder and harder and I continue to fail. Believe. I've been carrying this weight for years. Believe. Not, not believe in the church. Not, not believe in religiosity. Believe on Jesus Christ. He was lifted up on the cross. He shed his innocent blood so that you could be forgiven of your sin. Say, Tim, what will happen if I do those things? If you will surrender your life in faith and say, I'm going to stop trying to please God with my actions. I'm going to, I'm going to quit trying so hard. And surrender and accept the work that Christ did on the cross. So you're going to believe that his death on the cross was sufficient to pay your debt. You're going to accept it in your life. I believe in Jesus. I believe that he's God's son, that he died in my place, that he was buried and he rose again. He's alive. I believe in Jesus. You say, what happens then? I told you I'd share with you another one of my favorite verses. Here it is. It's in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now, say it, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Yeah, but Tim, you, you do not know what I've done. No, I don't. I don't know what you've done. I don't know what you've said. I don't know what you've thought. But God knows everything you've ever done. He's known, he, he's always known everything you would ever say and everything you will ever think. And he chose to send Jesus to die in your place. God knows it all. You say, Tim, there's no way I can be forgiven. 
When you and I make statements like there's no way I can be forgiven, there's no way I can find the hope that's in Jesus, you make a direct statement on the power of the Son of God and his ability at the cross. And I'm not willing to say that your sin is stronger than my God. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if I'm standing out here alone in a spiritual graveyard because I'm dead in my sins and I'm working and I'm working and I'm working and the guilt is still there and the shame is still there, the shackles of my choices are still there and I'm hearing the message today that if I'll just, I'll just run to Jesus and, and this, is, this is in Christ over here and I'll come and I'll put my faith in him and I'll find out that if I will come and trust in Jesus that my sin is gone, my shame is gone, my guilt is gone, the chains that bound me are gone, I would say today, I'm running to Jesus. I am running to Jesus because he's the only hope of the world. And so today, if you're here and what's lacking in your life is the hope that only Jesus provides, I want to encourage you today to do what I did a long time ago and that is believe. 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 Just believe. And right now you're considering that. And you're wondering, can this really be true? Can it really, really, really be true? The Apostle Paul was a murderer prior to Christ. And then he became the greatest church planner and theologian the world has ever known. What could God do with your life if you would just believe? And today I want to encourage you to do just that. The invitation is going to be simple this morning. I'm going to give you two opportunities to respond. Here's opportunity number one. If you're a believer here this morning, hearing a message about the good news of Jesus and the hope that he brings, uh, it ought to birth in us uncontainable, joyous worship. I mean, you, if you're sitting there as a believer and you remember what it was like to be lost and now what it's like to be found, to have been blind and now see, to be lame and now be able to walk and leap as believers, when we begin to worship in a second, it ought to be uncontainable joy for us. Believers, it's about time for us to stand and worship. Hopefully you're already worshiping in your heart. But if you're here today, and I've described you, you have a great need. You're in an awful situation, and you need a rescuer that can break the power of sin in your life. I want to encourage you to believe. I said, Tim, how do I do that? Well, you could say something like this to God. God, I need you. I have no other hope. And I'm a sinner. You could say that to God. God, I'm a sinner. And today, I believe in Jesus. I believe that he died on the cross for me. He shed his blood so that I could be forgiven. Rescue me today, God. Maybe you need to say that. I was thinking on the way down today. When I was praying that God would move in this service, not because of me, but because of the power of his word and the presence of the Holy Spirit. But I was thinking on the way down today, I wonder what it must be like for someone who's in the room that is not a believer. I wonder what that feels like today. And I want to say a couple things to you, and then I'm done. I'm going to close. You're wondering 
What in the world is everyone else going to think if today you surrender your entire life to Jesus? I need you to hear me say this. We're for you. Church, we're for you. And we want to celebrate with you as you surrender your life to Jesus. There are some folks in this room, some of us as believers, we, we've got a dark past. Amen, church? And God set us free from a lot of stuff. And we want to celebrate that with you today. So don't worry about what we're going to think. Okay, we're messed up. <laughs> the second thing I was thinking about if you're in the room today and you're not a believer is... Some of you have struggled with this decision for a while. And it's an exhausting decision. And I want to challenge you today to stop struggling and just give God your life. And let him do with your life what you never thought possible. You could wake up tomorrow morning with your sin debt completely erased and completely free of all the guilt if today you would surrender your life in faith today. You say, how do I do that? Well, I told you, you could just cry out to God. Just tell him you believe in your heart. You, you know you're a sinner and you believe. You have that next step card. Mark it on there. There's a place for you to say, I believe in Jesus Christ. Mark that on there. Maybe you want to come and talk to Pastor Tim or talk to me or, or one of the other leaders as we begin to worship in a second. I just want to encourage you, whatever it is, don't wait till tomorrow to make the greatest decision you will ever make in your life. Don't wait till tomorrow to make the greatest decision in your life. Let me pray with you. God, you're good and you're gracious. And your gift is amazing. The gift of your son, the gift of salvation, rescuing me out of my sin and my shame. God, I'm just so grateful today that you love me. And I pray that today, God, in this room, there are those that are apart from you that heard clearly that you love them and you want a relationship with them. You desire to God to forgive them and to bring them back into your house. Lord, I know this morning in this room or in Staunton or online, God, there's someone just like me that needs your grace and your forgiveness. They need to be born again. They need to be born by the Spirit of God, changed from the inside out. And so, God, I pray today for your strength and the moving of your Spirit today, God, to change us, transform us, And birth in us a hope that will anchor our souls in a world of hopelessness. I pray in Christ's name for his kingdom, his sake, and his glory. Amen.